our lives as Christians are meant to live in that Adventist season, that, that we're living in a life of preparation. So it's not like, wow, four weeks we did that, okay, check that off the box, now I'm going to move on. It, it's really a posture that we begin to take. And part of that pro- posture we talked about in the first week was anticipation. And, and that's, that's an, an act of an, an a hopeful engagement in the present. I'm anticipating what's going to happen. Um, we watch sporting events with anticipation of, of, of looking ahead, what we're hopeful, we're engaged, we're in the moment, we're in the present, and that's what we're supposed to do, anticipate that coming, being in the present. And then preparation takes place, and it's getting ready for what's to come, that there's a plan involved, that, that I'm, I'm doing things, I'm aligning things in my life in this relationship with a living God, and I'm living out in this preparatorial work of my life, of my spiritual life, of that formational life that he wants me to have. And then there's expectations. And expectations know what God will do in our life. It's knowing what God will do. I know what I can expect. If you read the scriptures in there or the promises, and you could know what to expect in your life from God. You could know right now what to expect, and you can know what to expect when you meet him. But we should live in that expectant faith. We should have that expectation, that anticipation, that that preparation in our life, not just during Advent, in all of our lives, in, in each day of our life, living in the fullness of knowing that. Now, in Luke chapter 1, verse 26 through 38, we have the angel Gabriel appearing to Mary who's just going about her day like any other day. She's she's planning her wedding to Joseph. She's just going about her day, doing the things that she would normally do, probably really excited about what's happening as she's betrothed to Joseph, which is this preparatorial time that this marriage, this contract is is solidified in a sense that they're, they're preparing a life ahead, and he's off getting the house ready and doing what he needs to do and, and this joyous, exciting time where she's anticipating and, and there's this excitement and there's this preparation and there's this expectation for her own life that now beginning in this marriage, she's just going about her day like any other day, except this day was going to be different than any other day in her life. And what happens is there's an invitation that she's given that changes the course of history. And she's given this invitation in Luke chapter 1, verse 28. And it says this, And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. That's quite a greeting. Blessed are you among women. Now, what we need to know, unless, I don't know if many of you have had a visitation from an angel lately, but, but angels are these spiritual beings that God's created. They take human form and shape, but they're not human. And this angel Gabriel appears within that moment. And when an angel of the Lord appears, there's three things that happen. First is fear. It's not the little hallmark card of the angel with the little cherub. It's an angel of God. And the first thing is a holy fear. Second is faith, and the third is favor. And when you see angels appear, those are the things that happen. There's there's fear, there's faith, and there's favor. But there's three other things that happen when angels appear. And it depends on how we respond in that moment when we meet an angelic being. The other three is denial, destruction, and death. Which three do you think we should be on? Fear, Faith and favor. We don't want the other three. And, and these angels, they're messengers sent from God. And when they come, they come to warn, they come to confront, to guide people and communicate God's message to them. That that's what they're doing in, in that moment. And in Luke chapter 1, verse 30 through 31, then the angel says to her, do not be afraid. Fear first, right? Don't be afraid. Mary, you found favor with God, faith. And behold, you'll conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and he shall call his name Jesus. 
favor. The angel Gabriel is the one, believe it or not, who started the whole gender reveal thing. (laughs) And the whole gender reveal thing really has gotten out of hand. Since 2008, people have begun this journey of of one-upping each other on gender reveals. So much so, I was reading about it, and it's insane. It's literally insane. People have lost their minds. Like, well, I know what we have to do. And as a result, there's been death as a result of it. There's been explosions. There was one that 45,000 acres were burned down. There was a plane crash. A car exploded. And I'm thinking, like, this is insane. But Gabriel was the first to come and announce the gender reveal of what's going to take place. It's the ultimate gender, gender reveal. It's the birth announcement unlike any other. And this is the announcement, what he says in verse 32 to 33. He'll be great, and he'll be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. See, there's there's no fanfare. There's no live stream. There's no plane flying overhead. There's no explosions. The earth didn't tremble or shake. What's taking place is just Gabriel and Mary revealing what God's going to do through her life if she would say yes. The ultimate gender reveal. See, what doesn't make sense if we really understand who Mary is in this this moment is that what we see is the Lord brings down the mighty, but he exalts the lowly. What the Lord does is he takes a nobody and he makes him somebody who will be blessed. That's what he does for each of our lives brings down the mighty, but he lifts up the lowly. And it's not fanfare, it's not this big thing, it's us meeting the Lord within that moment and how we respond when the Lord comes to us. He meets us in that most lowly place. And we see what happens with Mary. Mary surrenders her life for the Lord. She surrenders because she wants his perfect will to be done. She surrenders for what it is that God has planned and God has in store for her life. And and I believe that when we look at Advent, we can look at Mary's lived her life in in an Advent season. She's faithful to her belief, to understanding of God's promises, to living out that life. Even when he comes to her, she didn't have all the answers. It wasn't fully written of this is what will take place. This is going to be the rest of the story. And even though she didn't know the rest and and it wouldn't be complete, regardless, Mary's response is, I am your maidservant of the Lord. Let it be to me, let it be done to me according to your will. That's her response. I don't know the outcome of this. I don't know what the future brings. But, but let it be done to me. And like Mary, we're called to surrender life and surrender our life, a life to a life that will glorify God. And, and if I'm living a life that's not glorifying God, I'm not living the life that God has called me to. And she surrenders that, that her life could just glorify God. I don't know the outcome. I don't know what... If she would have known the rest of the story, what would happen to her son, she would have said no. She couldn't have endured it. But she knew she had to say yes because God would be with her. And she knew that she could glorify God with her life and that God would give her grace through whatever the future would bring. Let it be to me according to you, well, whatever your will is. And And let it be according to your will, Lord, that I, too, would live a surrendered life. And why do we live that surrendered life? Because it's out of a surrendered life that then we can glorify 
God with our life. We can't glorify God with a prideful life. We can glorify God with a surrendered life. When we read Mary goes off to visit Elizabeth, uh, just like the angel Gabriel said, he, he gave her this whole word of what would take place, and Elizabeth was pregnant with, with John. That's Gabriel's gender reveal number two, by the way. <laughs> said, this is what's going to take place. And Mary greets Elizabeth, and we read John leaps in his mother's womb. And then Elizabeth's going to begin to prophesy over Mary. That, that you know, you read the Christmas story, you be, read beginning of Luke, it is the most profound, prophetic, spirit-filled understanding of what God's doing in a moment that we could, we could understand how God intervened and the greater work of his Holy Spirit was working within humanity to bring us to a place of salvation. And we see this transpire and, and we see what happens as, as they meet. And then John leaps in his mother's womb and, and, and Elizabeth begins to speak these words, these prophetic words. It's a holy moment as they're gathered together, one with the Savior of the world and one who will be the foreteller of what's to come, preparing a way for that Savior. And she cries out, blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. That Elizabeth knows what God has called her to. He knows the blessing on her life. And then we see in this response how Mary responds to Elizabeth in Luke chapter 1, verse 46. Mary says, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. Mary begins to break out in a song, a song of real joy, a song of a life that would be surrendered, that, that a soul that would magnify God and, 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 and give him praise for all he is, a life that would glorify God. And I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but what does it mean to have your soul magnify the Lord? That your soul would magnify him. Well, magnification changes our view of things, right? That's what magnification is. It changes a view. And we are to magnify God um, like a telescope, not like a microscope. See, a microscope makes tiny things look bigger than they are. That's what the microscope does. It makes tiny things look bigger than they are. But a telescope helps us to see the enormous things for what they really are. And when we magnify God with our life, it's not making him bigger. It means he becomes bigger in our life. See, Mary was making Jesus bigger by allowing her soul to magnify who he was. It's making him bigger. And when we magnify God, we see how big he truly is. We see the enormity. And when we say, I magnify the Lord, it simply means I'm making you greater more important in my life, I'm putting you first. That my soul would magnify the Lord. What we're saying is you are all of my focus and you are my priority in my life. When we show people how big our God is, when, when, we, when we show people that we're, we're saying, look through this telescope, not a microscope. You know, I think the problem is most of the time we're looking at a microscope to point out all the things that are wrong in people. We put each other under this microscopic way and we want to point out all the flaws and, and, and all the things that are wrong versus leading them over to a telescope and saying, let me show you how big our God is that writes all those wrongs. And he's not, let me tell you something, he's not looking at your life through a microscope. He's looking at your life through his son so that you can magnify who God truly is in your own life. That you can make God bigger 
in your own life and through your life. That's what it means to let my soul. Am I making my life a way that others can see God bigger? Or do I live my life that others wouldn't want to even know God? But Mary says, let my soul, let it magnify God. Let my focus, my priority. And, and then we too should be showing people how big our God truly is. See, our actions, our behaviors can reduce the Lord or they can magnify the Lord. But we have to respond as believers. And we should be responding that our lives too magnify him. It was only through Mary's humility that we are able to see how big our God truly is. So may our love for God change the perception to the people around us. See, may our love for God invite people to look into the telescope and say, I want you to see how big my God truly is. That our our love for God is the one who's come and met you exactly where you are, not counting your sins against you, but that he loves you. That he's making you whole. Come see how big my God is in any circumstance, in any trouble, in any trial, in any situation. Come see. Come see how big my God is. That our love changes the perception of people around us because they're seeing through us how big our God truly is. Church, let us magnify the Lord with our lives. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we're we're asking that we be telescopes, not microscopes. And if you're here, you might not know how big God truly is. I'd love to introduce you to him. He invites us into a relationship with him. And how do I get there? Well, I've got to change some things. First is I've got to head in a new direction. And that new direction is that, Lord, I'm surrendering those areas in my life. I'm repenting from those areas in my life that... I want you to be the big God of who you are so my soul can proclaim you. And you invite him into your life so he can change your heart and renew your mind. And that's a prayer. And I don't know your heart, but you know your heart and he knows your heart. And I want to give you an invitation that you can know him in that way and begin to see how big God truly is for your life. So if you just want to pray this and you want to ask him in and begin to head in that new direction, just Repeat this prayer after me in your heart. Say, God, I need you. I I thank you. You died on a cross for my sin. I, I open my heart. And I invite you in. Now, lead me and take control of my life. And and make me into the disciple you called me to be. That I can be a reflection of how big you are. And I ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you pray with me, and and that was an earnest prayer right now, here's one of the important things to do is is to let us know, but I'm going to give you some advice right now. If that's an earnest prayer that you began this new journey right now in this moment, here's what you got to do. First thing you got to do is begin to pray. And I don't care that you don't know how to pray. Just sit down and say, Lord, I don't know how to pray, and this is called praying, and I'm praying right now. And he'll meet you in the midst of that prayer in all humility, and, 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 and humble yourself and say, God, I just need you. Be present. Speak to me. I want this relationship. Just begin to pray. Second thing is after you begin to pray, get a Bible and begin to read the Bible because it's a living word of God that will direct your life. And, and you open that up and begin in the Gospel of John. Read, begin to read somewhere that God will begin to speak of who he is. Third thing is you need to not be alone but be in community. Because isolation will always keep you separated. But it's community that builds us up. And you don't have a community, you're invited to this community. But you need to get others around you. And it's in those three things that your life will begin to radically change and head in the direction that God has planned for you. Amen?